on a faculty member is to elect her to be an invited faculty lecturer. This semester, you, her students, and her peers have bestowed that honor on Dr. Michelle Marino, assistant professor of history. Dr. Marino earned her BA from Hanover College in Indiana in 2004, her Master's of Arts from the University of Louisville in 2007, and her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2013. She has been at Hastings College since the fall of 2012, where her teaching specialties have included 20th century US social and cultural history, oral history, women's history, and sports history. She is, as this honor indicates, becoming one of our best and our most popular instructors. We are lucky to have her. Dr. Marino and her husband, Tony, have a 10-month-old son named Nathan, also known as Maddie. Dr. Marino is an avid sports fan, though she has not yet gotten the memo about the requirement for baseball affection in academia. Nonetheless, she enjoys watching football and basketball, playing the latter when she can. She also walks regularly with Tony and Maddie and is attempting to introduce competitive napping into the family. Maddie is not cooperating. Dr. Marino's dissertation at the University of Massachusetts was entitled Sweating Femininity, Women, Athletes, Masculine Culture, and American Inequality from 1939 to the Present. It has become the basis for two very successful J-term classes at Hastings College. She is in negotiations with two university presses for it to become the basis of what I am sure will be a very successful book, and it is the basis for this lecture, which you have invited her to give today. Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, staff, and students, Dr. Michelle M. Marino. Thank you so much for the attempt at a slow clap right there. All my athletic and academic dreams are coming true right now. So, first of all, I just want to thank you all so much for attending my talk today. I'm very, very honored to be giving this lecture. Um, but I'd like to start first by posing a few questions to you all. So, first off, how many of you have heard about the sport of roller derby? Most of you, okay. How many of you have seen it played? A few less, okay. How many of you that have seen it played have seen a men's game? Aaron Pierce and one other person randomly in the back. Okay, <laughs> great. That's about what I expected. So let's talk here for a second about what we know about the sport and the players. Most of you seem to have some idea of what roller derby is. What are some things we know? And for the 25 of you here that know more about roller derby than 95% of the rest of the world, shut your traps for just a couple minutes, all right? So what do we know about roller derby? Not all at once, take one at a time. Okay, there's an aspect of violence to it. What else do we know? It's on roller skates, roller blades. Campy, what do you mean? Yes, the alter egos, the, the, the get up, okay. There's, yes, there's always this comparison to wrestling, right? Anything else we know? Spandex, sometimes good, sometimes bad, right? Okay, all right, so we have some base knowledge. We'll talk about some of these issues here um, as we continue, all right? But perhaps some of you are wondering how I came to study roller derby. That seems a little random, right? Okay. So, I am a lifelong basketball player and fan, and while working on my doctorate, I knew I wanted to focus on women's sports. Um, so for my dissertation in my second year of grad school at UMass Amherst, I was looking for a sport to compare with basketball, and my advisor suggested roller derby. And I thought to myself, eh, okay, what about it? Um, and I had these vague notions of seeing something of roller derby on TV, on like TNN in the 1990s, like when American Gladiators was on TV. And my advisor said, you know, I know it's been around a long time, and there's been this modern resurgence of it, so you should just check it out. 
And so I took his advice, and I did. And I started learning about the modern roller derby leagues in Austin, Texas, and out of New York City. And I became fascinated with it, because I recognized some of the same gender, femininity, sexuality tensions that I had long recognized in studying basketball. So I learned that roller derby had been around since 1935, but I also came to discover what everyone seems to remember about the sport was from the late 1960s and early 70s that seemed more akin to professional wrestling, and that was in actuality a vastly different game from the 1930s through the 1950s. So I studied roller derby for over a year before I got the courage to make contact with a local team in Northampton, Massachusetts. Now, I use this word courage intentionally because the recruitment night that I attended was called Fresh Meat Night. <laughs> so I was super nervous about it. Of course, it's terrifying when you're going to something called Fresh Meat. I told my husband if I wasn't back in three hours to come looking for me. But my intentions for going to this local league were to just check it out so I could learn more about the sport and understand it better actually on an academic level. I had studied it, but I really wanted to get a feel for how it worked, um, what it felt like, what the logistics of it were like, but something happened while I was there. The problem is here that I don't like to be bad at things and I don't like to lose. And I was not really good at skating and I did not like that. The last time I had skated was like at the roller cave in fifth grade at a birthday party. And this lack of skills clearly demonstrated in the photo evidence here um, where this other skater is about to put me on my ass. If there was a third picture, that's what you'd see, but I didn't want to include that. Um, but I'm an athlete and I wanted to be good. And I wanted to be a part of a team. There are not a lot of team opportunities for women my age, although let's not concern ourselves with what that might be. Um, but there's just not opportunities in competitive sports for women, after college, really. They simply don't exist on a serious amateur level. And so I kept coming back to the roller derby. For two and a half years, I continued to play. So the roller derby league that I joined in late 2009 was Pioneer Valley Roller Derby, or PVRD. And this league was the first to have a men's team in the modern revival of the sport. And when I say modern revival, I'm referring to the roller derby which emerged post-2001. Now I tell you about my league for two specific reasons. The first is PVRD is a co-ed league, but they had a separate men's and women's team within the league structure. The teams practiced together, they scrimmaged together, and against each other. Which, mind you, as a female athlete, if you can learn to take a hit from a 215-pound man who refers to himself solely as Mongo, you're pretty much good to take a hit from anybody, right? Okay, so reason one. Reason two, this being part of a co-ed league was not weird to me because when I joined, um, I had already been studying for over a year, right? And as a historian, I was aware that roller derby had been a co-ed sport since its inception in 1935. And in fact, men and women used to play together on the same team. So again, I didn't question the structure, but that structure is actually very rare um, in the modern revival. There's a handful of co-ed leagues or teams around the country that practice together and play together, and there's more that have developed close relationships, if not fully united. Now, in Nebraska, Omaha is the only city to host a male roller derby team with the Big O Roller Bros. Uh -huh. Let that sit for a second. Um, but the vast majority of roller derby leagues and teams that have formed since 2001 are women's. Now currently there are over 1,300 women's leagues and only 130 men's leagues. Nebraska has uh, five women's teams at least that I'm aware of. Some teams fold um, and pop back up and only one men's team. So as many of you know, in January 2014, we made history here at Hastings College when I taught the first ever college course on the sport of roller derby. Hastings does that. <laughs> I had a blast with the class, and I think the students enjoyed it as well. We went skating, which was particularly fun, seeing our track stars on skates and our football guys on skates. I'm talking Jordan Wallman, is he here specifically? Um, but we attended a roller derby scrimmage in Grand Island, and we Skyped with the former commissioner of the sport. 
Now, at the end of the class, I did in-depth course evaluations and got really positive feedback overall. But I had one student who indicated that while he or she enjoyed the class, he or she really did not like how the modern game was sexist towards men. So what this student was referring to is that in the modern version of roller derby, a majority of the leagues are female owned and operated. And while they allow men to help out in their leagues and coach their teams, men are not allowed to be rostered skaters. Women's roller derby is governed by a national body called WIFTDA, or the Women's Flat Track Derby Association. And WIFTDA's requirements are that a team or league must have 51% female ownership to belong, which cuts out some co-ed leagues, most notably the one that I played in, uh, PVRD, which had a men's team, the Dirty Dozen, and the female team, the WMDs, or the Western Mass Destruction. So what I'm interested in here, and what I'd like to focus on today, are the gender politics that have emerged in recent years between the modern women's and men's roller derby, given the long history of gender equality and progressivism within the sport. Now, the gender politics behind roller derby are controversial, as you can imagine, in many ways. And I came to understand that as I studied and played the sport, and most recently as I've taught the sport which has prompted me to revisit this very specific aspect of my research. Now, jumping back to my students' evaluation about derby, that the modern game was sexist towards men, on the one hand, I bristle at this comment. My inner feminist dies a little bit, right? In an age where meninism is becoming a cultural, if completely ridiculous, movement, In an age where the phrase binders full of women is used, I find it a little bit difficult to sympathize. The sporting realm has largely been dominated by men and treated as a masculine preserve, an arena in which to prove manhood. Women have such a long history of discrimination in sport. Men have football, men have baseball, most of the media coverage, most of the head coaching jobs. 80 to 90% of schools are still not in compliance with Title IX. So what if women want to keep this one sport to themselves? So what if they want to govern and control their own sport? Can't they have this one? But then on the other hand, I think about this long discrimination against women in sport. It's not cool. Turns out discrimination is not cool. I think about the long history of the sport of roller derby. Roller derby is the sport that allowed women to play as equals from the get-go. And now women are turning their backs on that rich history and denying men the opportunities they themselves were given by the sport in an age when no one else provided such an opportunity. And I actually have to agree with my student. Roller derby from the outset has been a co-ed egalitarian sport, although not without its faults. But the recent revival has emphasized a feminist space for women, a league of their own, if you will. But by claiming the space for their own, they are also denying a partnership with men who love the sport, respect the women's game, and do not want a hostile takeover, but rather a shared space, much like one of the past. So I think the larger lesson here is about looking to the past to contextualize these tensions today to see if modern roller derby will head in the direction of a more equal past or if it will evolve into a modern, sex-segregated future. Recent developments demonstrate that the women of Wiftida are shifting their positions on the future of the sport. So, I am a historian. You can't get away from the history totally. So I want to talk about the history of roller derby here for a bit. So Leo Seltzer was an entertainment businessman and promoter, although he hated that term, promoter. And he needed an event um, that would draw crowds to the Chicago Coliseum during the throes of the Great Depression. And he came up with a new sport called roller derby in 1935. The first ever transcontinental roller derby was hosted at the Coliseum on August 13, 1935. This early version of the game was different than what we think of now. The way it worked was that there would be about 25 two-person teams, each team consisting of a male and female partner, and it was their goal to skate the 3,000 mile distance from New York to San Diego, which equated to about 57,000 laps around the track. 
And the progress was tracked on a lit map in the infield, so you could see how far they were moving. Now, one member of each team had to be on the track for at least 11 and a half hours each day. And the roller derby would last usually around a month. So clearly, this was a game of speed and endurance, but not of contact, okay? So very shortly, the sport evolved, though, to a two-team format with a pass-for-points system. And in 1937, the game shifted to become what we know now with the addition of contact. So I want to briefly explain to you how the sport works just so you get a general sense of the rules of the game. So the updated version of roller derby, uh, post-1937, um, consisted of five players from each team to all start on the track together, okay? Each team consisted of jammers, which were denoted by stars on their helmets, and blockers, one of which was later called a pivot, who served as the on-track captain. Now, upon the referee's whistle, all 10 players would begin skating counterclockwise around the track and would group together to what's, formed, or what's called a pack. Once the pack was formed, the jammers, who began in the back of the pack, would attempt to work their way through the pack and break free from the blockers. So we have everybody lumped up here in a pack, the jammers are trying to break their way through and then skate around and lap the pack, all right? The blockers' job was to prevent the other team's jammers from breaking away from the pack while helping their own jammers break out as quickly as possible. So this is accomplished through strategic maneuvering and blocking, but essentially both teams are playing both offense and defense simultaneously, which is very difficult. Now, as soon as the first jammer breaks away from that pack, the jam clock begins, and this jammer is called the lead jammer. Now, this means that the jammers then have two minutes to try to lap the pack and attempt to score as many points as possible before the jam time runs out. So jammers score points for each member of the opposite team that they pass after they had lapped the pack once, okay? Now, jams do not have to last the full two minutes. Jams could be called off by the lead jammer placing their hands on their hips like this. Although a few modifications occurred throughout the years, the basic premise of the sport created in 1937 last until the modern day. So men and women are on the same team but they do not usually skate against each other. Women skated against the other women's team in period one, and then men skated against other men's team in period two, but picked right up, right up where the scoring left off. So it is cumulative scoring. So I'm gonna show you here a very quick one minute video so you get a sense of what it would have looked like in 1950, if this will cooperate. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, from the Lower Glass New Armory in Newark, New Jersey. This is Joe Hassel speaking and greeting you on behalf of Ken Nidell. Well, we are in the seventh game of a 10-game series with a score of Jersey Four, Brooklyn Two. They're in the and process the of switching the from the men being on the track to the women going on the track. We're about happening. to get underway in the seventh period with the girls taking over. Now, you fans know how the roller derby goes. The idea is to lap the opposition. To pass one or two, it's one point. Three or four is two points. Five is five points. Penalties are handed out for slugging, holding, illegal blocking, and so on. A jam is two minutes. The skating period is 15 minutes. The jam is over when the leading jam skater puts his hands on his hips. The leading jammer leaves the track with both skates, all falls, or gets a penalty. There's the initial jam of the seventh period, and here's Ken Nidell. All right. The jam is underway now. Got their hard for the Brooklyn team. Number 17, Jacqueline Dubetsky. Out there with it now, Little Millie Bruner, number 64, in the familiar colors of the New Jersey team. Number 64, Millie Bruno, black sleeves, black shoulder on that very orange body of the jersey. Nice blocking in the front of that pack there by Edie Branham. Very unusual to see Branham with her helmet on. And there's Slugger Keely taking a block from Bobby Branham. Okay. So I think you get the idea, right? All right, so the sport quickly grew through the Depression and World War II hampered the sport a little due to men being drafted to the war, but it does pick up, uh, back up in the late 1940s and then due to its appearance on TV in the late 40s and early 1950s. It becomes hugely popular throughout the nation and this period is often called its golden era. So Leo's son, Jerry, takes over for his father in 1959 
And this marked a transition in its operations and shifted from a base in New York to one in California. By the early 1960s, the sport was becoming more theatrical due to fan response to this entertainment factor. There's another uh, peak of popularity in the late 60s, but then due to a loss in TV contracts, financial instability, and the national gas crisis of the early 70s, the seltzer-owned roller derby folds in late 1973 after a four-decade run. So the gender equality ethic that I've been talking about in the roller derby is part in due to the personal ethics of Leo Seltzer and his son Jerry, and partially due to their business acumen. Famed sports writer Frank DeFord, who spent about six weeks traveling with the roller derby in the late 1960s, explained to me in an oral history interview, there was equality in the roller derby. That's the simple thing. It was absolute equality in the roller derby. The fact that women were playing a full contact sport made it unique. Contact sports are traditionally labeled inappropriate for women, and women who engage in such are usually considered suspect. Furthermore, derby was never modified for women. Men and women played under the exact same rule set from the outset. Leo Seltzer knew that women were capable competitors, and in fact, he stated in 1950, let's face it, women aren't the weaker sex. Nature made them stronger. They are far sturdier than men, he declared. This philosophy is in direct contrast with such sports as basketball that continually modified the rules and the court for women to make it less strenuous for them. So as President Obama noted in his State of the Union in January, women are not, still not getting paid the same, uh, the same for equal work in 2015. In the Seltzer Roller Derby, men and women earned the same pay and same benefits. Is famed skater Jerry Murray rhetorically, rhetorically questioned, since they were doing the same job, how could they be treated any differently? Sometimes women skaters even earned more than their male counterparts in order to keep the women with the derby. I got paid as much as my husband or more, explained Murray, who was married to the popular skater Jean Gammon. Usually the girls got paid more to keep them there. Now, pay was actually prorated based upon rank and talent in what Jerry Seltzer described as a star system. The top skaters earned more, and women were always amongst the top skaters. Mary Upel explained, there were different levels, like the captains and the coaches would earn more money. A top skater got a little more money than the guy that was just a sword carrier, you know? Now, if indeed women were going to be critical to the sport, the issue of their maternity had to be addressed. Now, the very first years of the sport, Leo Seltzer tried to prevent his skaters from fraternizing, read, hookup, or marrying because he understood that he lost a competitor if a female skater would get pregnant. But he was also worried about losing his skaters to a non-derby relationship or marriage, which might take them away from the sport permanently. So he relented and attempted to accommodate intra-derby marriages by allowing cohabitation. Further, advanced men would make sure the skating mothers had access to babysitters and strollers and the like when on the road, and children often accompanied the parents on team buses. The sport of roller derby provided an alternative sporting model for the athlete mother, challenging dominant social norms that restricted women in their attempts to combine their roles as wife, mother, and athlete. Unlike other sports of the mid-century and today, Roller Derby not only accepted and supported athlete mothers, it also embraced families as a whole. Now, despite the Seltzer emphasis on equality, the Derby and the Seltzers couldn't fully escape the times in which they lived. The organization and many of the skaters themselves still engaged in what sociologist Jan Felschen has dubbed apologetic behavior. In a women's sports context, this term means basically that because the women are engaging in a traditionally male pastime, i.e. sport, they have to compensate for it in some way to prove their normality and their femininity due to this perceived role conflict. So roller derby news publications constantly highlighted the beauty and femininity of the female skaters, even as they lauded the women for their participation in this full contact sport. Articles continually featured stories and pictures that emphasized the attractive looks, the charming nature, and pleasing personalities of the women skaters. For instance, headlines and captions such as, Meet to Miss Glamour, Roller Derby's newest it girl, and Petite and Sweet appeared regularly. The most obvious example of such apologetic behavior is the Roller Derby Queen Contest. 
Each year, the women skaters took part in a beauty contest of sorts, where fans voted on the most attractive skater to be elected roller derby queen. Participating in such rituals as beauty contests allowed the women athletes to push social boundaries while simultaneously adhering to mainstream values, um, as reflected by such social institutions as the Miss America pageant. After all, one journalist wrote, a woman wants to be a woman regardless of her profession. Roller derby or otherwise, the women the world over want to be feminine. So while the derby held a beauty contest for their women to highlight their glamour and downplay their roughness and appeal to the fans, the roller derby men were not exempt from this ritual of legitimation either. A roller derby king contest was held annually as well. As Jerry Seltzer explained about the contest, we were equal, that was it. But unlike women, men have rarely been defined primarily by their physical beauty. So it was not the foremost concern in the roller derby king contest. The roller derby king was noted for his good looks, but his general popularity and personality were also integral to his election. For the king contest, fans were instructed to mail in their ballots for their favorite male skater, as opposed to merely the best looking as was touted for the women's contest. While inclusive of mothers and children, roller derby management and publications also highlighted the mothers in their ranks as a way to soften the image of the stereotypical roughneck woman derbyist. This was done in the same way as highlighting the female skater's femininity and good looks. If you can see in these two pictures here on uh, my right, <laughs> yeah, um, if you can see in the two pictures there, um, uh, pictures, I'm sorry, of Tuffy Brazoon and Jerry Murray being elected to the Hall of Fame. Each is pictured with her son as opposed to an action shot of her skating. Further, no maternity pay was available for pregnant skaters when they took time off unless they continued on as a coach. But despite a few traditional adherents, having children did not weaken the women's value. The roller derby needed the women's skaters and so motherhood came to be an accepted and expected part of the woman's skater's life. Instead of pushing mothers into a singular role and out of the sport, skater Mary Lou Palermo explained, the roller derby always worked it out. So coming back then up to modern time, the modern game emerged in early 2001, although it took about a year and a half for the new skaters to learn the game and figure out what model they wanted to operate under. And there was a lot of sort of initial drama um, that caused an early split amongst the ranks and the skaters. But now in its revived infancy, the original leagues insisted upon female-only leadership after being burnt by a sketchy guy who claimed he was going to promote them and then took their money and skipped town. They also institutionalized sexy uniforms, alter egos, uh, that were sort of had jacked up attitudes and athleticism. There was also an emphasis on this DIY or do-it-yourself ethic. And also, the very first bouts were a combination of skill and staged moves for crowd entertainment. Now, they very quickly moved away from this to a completely legitimate skating and became uh, what we would consider true sport. By 2004, the emergent model became one of skater-owned and operated with a for-the-skater, by-the-skater, nonprofit modus operandi. The sport spread rapidly across the country and even the world, and numbers absolutely exploded. And as the roller derby grew, they came to realize that they needed a governing body. So a group called the United Leagues Coalition formed in 2004 and then renamed themselves WIFTDA, or the Women's Flat Track Derby Association, in 2005. And they were founded to establish the rules and principles uh, to govern and also promote the sport. And they bought into this idea that it was a sport for women. And they promoted themselves as women who worked hard, they challenged themselves, and enjoyed teamwork, and also empowered women. But they were also determined to control their own future and establish the sport on their own terms. So, while almost every single league in existence nods their head to the long history of roller derby and pays a brief tribute to the history of the sport on their websites, most leagues seem to ignore or at least forget the fact that roller derby was one of the first sports to include women as equal competitors alongside men from the very beginning. Women no longer want to include men as their partners on the track. 
So coming back full circle here, this has long been a problem for PVRD, Pioneer Valley Roller Derby, the co-ed league in Massachusetts that I skated in. PVRD was founded in 2005 by Sarah Lang and Jake Fahey, who are pictured here, who each had a 50% ownership of the league. As Fahey explained, really it was just that I wanted to play. We knew that guys weren't doing it, so we knew that that would be a change or that would not be usual, so to speak. But I don't know if we really thought that it was that big of a deal at that point. But because PVRD was owned by Lang and Fahey equally, and its members play competitors that are not women, meaning the men's team competes against other men's team, the women's team was never able to join WIFTEDA, as the rules currently stood for the first decade of their existence. And of course, the men's team was not allowed to join either. So members of PVRD and other men's leagues on the East Coast that had formed got together in 2007 and formed the Men's Derby Coalition, which later changed its name to Men's Roller Derby Association, or MURDA, pun intended. <laughs> MURDA formed in order to emphasize resource sharing and benefits, also game sanctioning, and to complement WIFTEDA. And eventually, WIFTEDA acknowledged an unofficial partnership with MURDA. But with WIFTEDA's membership limited to female skater owned and operated leagues, and MURDA, a men's derby governing association, who only admitted men's teams, some women's teams fell through the cracks. Because of their association with men, these teams could not join WIFTEDA. And because of their sex, they could not join MURDA. Those practicing feminism in sport through inclusion got left out. So when I finished my dissertation in 2012, that's where things stood. WIFTEDA was sizing MURDA up, trying to gauge their intentions and reliability, and MURDA was trying to build men's derby to complement women's, although they were and still are far behind the curve. There are hundreds of more uh, women's leagues than men's, although both continue to grow. Roller derby is still largely considered a women's sport. However, just in the last few months, recent developments indicate that WIFTEDA is rethinking their stance on men's derby. On July 3rd, 2014, WIFTEDA announced the following, quote, WIFTEDA and MURDA are excited to announce their formal agreement to collaborate and develop a number of areas of joint interest moving into 2015. This agreement will foster additional collaboration between the two roller derby governing bodies in the areas of rules development, safety guidelines, official certification, tournament dates, and other games-related systems. The associations have committed to sharing resources, reducing duplicative efforts, and aligning organizational systems when possible. During the period of the initial one-year agreement, the organizations have also committed to examine the best ways for existing or extending membership to leagues that have both a men's and women's team under the same business structure. So while not quite you joined as a unified body. It appears after much consideration, modern roller derby is finally moving towards their more progressive past. Thank you. be more than happy to take any questions that people have at this point. I think there's a microphone if we need it, but. Yes, Laura. interesting transition um, in roller derby. They sort of um, promoted themselves in the early years as being this sort of counterculture thing. They didn't want to be mainstream. Now there's been tension in the, just the last few years of where do we see the future of the sport going? And even though they're still very much holding on to this do-it-yourself ethic, um, this space of empowerment for both women and men to some extent, um, they realize that if they want to be long-term self-sustaining, they need to begin training people at younger ages. And so they've started junior roller derby leagues to do this. Now the other sort of part of that is um, there's also a big push within a lot of modern um, 
leagues in terms of the future of the sport is we might want to someday be included in the Olympics to legitimize ourselves as a sport. To do that, you have to have youth programs and both men's and women's roller derby. So that's sort of, um, they're taking that next step. But they're also, um, as sort of the novelty has worn out the last couple years of roller derby, they're trying to ensure in future by getting kids in at earlier ages, but they also view it as empowerment for young girls too. So part of the sexualization is starting to be toned down a bit. That also was part of the novelty at the beginning, but a lot of the women who still engage in wearing the fishnets and the short skirts and some of that, they see it as empowerment. They don't see it as sexualization in the traditional terms. Yeah. Michelle, I have yes. to admit that before I met you, I didn't even know this existed because I'm <laughs> such a dork about sports. <laughs> right. um, can you talk a little bit about the the history that you sort of glossed over, which is that sort of weird, well, like the, the wrestling analogy, early 70s. Well, yeah. What happened there? I mean, what, what, what was that about? Yeah, so there's a couple things going on. One is I just talked about the Seltzer Roller Derby. The Seltzers in 1935, this goes to his business acumen, he patented and copyrighted the sport. So nobody else could use the term roller derby. So they sort of cornered the market for a while, but whenever skaters would get mad at the seltzers, they would form, form what are called outlaw leagues. These were not governed by the same sort of stringent rules that the seltzers had. So as business sort of tanked a little bit in the late 60s and 70s, a couple different things happened simultaneously. One is they realized they needed to drum up more uh, fans, right? They came to realize that fans liked the theatrical aspects of it. So they began doing more of those things, right? Um, the other thing that happens is a lot of lasting outlaw leagues begin going into existence, and a lot of those, which people assume are roller derby, are not the seltzer roller derby. So a lot of what the, um, again, really theatrical, you see some of these where they're like skating over alligator pits and like really strange stuff like that, um, are more of the outlaw leagues as opposed to the seltzer one. But really an interesting fact about this is when Jerry Seltzer took over in 59, um, the year 59 and 60, they had been sort of playing with a little bit more of the theatrical aspect of it. And for their, they had a, like a World Series every year, essentially. And they told the skaters very specifically, you skate completely legit. We don't want any of the theatrics. We don't want anything. There was a huge fan outcry claiming that it was rigged, even though they were skating legit. And so they then responded to the fans, obviously, for that push of the entertainment factor. So that's part of what happens. And roller derby doesn't actually officially die out in 1973 when the seltzer closes. It's just that the seltzer derby does and all these other leagues then pop up. So a majority of what people actually saw in the 60s and 70s may have not even been seltzer roller derby. It was the other ones. And they, and they came up with really creative names because you couldn't say roller derby. It would be like skating derby league or, you know, roll, or I'm trying to think we, um, the other famous one, like roller jam type stuff. You know, they'd make up all sorts of ones. So, Aaron. Alongside the effort to legitimize the sport and make it like Olympic ready, mm -hmm. do you view the more recent move toward equality as legitimate gender equality within the sport or sort of a conciliatory pandering toward like the Olympic Commission to say, look how equal we are because Olympic sports, in spite of being both sexes, aren't equal. Right. Yeah, no, it's more about general conciliation between the two. Um, not everyone, even within the roller derby, wants to take that path. Um, so they're still split amongst themselves of whether we even want to go in this mainstream traditional trajectory of what happens to sport. A lot of people are still dragging their heels on that. Um, so I think it's more about realizing that, okay, women are safely established in roller derby, so they don't fear a hostile takeover anymore. So now that they feel like, okay, we've sort of made it, people know who we are, what we do, and respect us for that, they can branch out and include the men in different ways. And I think at the beginning, too, they just weren't sure what the men's motives were. Like, do they want to take us over and push women out, or did they want a partnership? And I think Murda has sort of proved themselves that they don't want to take over, they want to work as partners, and even then it wouldn't be full partnership because it's so fewer men's leagues at this point. Yeah, so that's a good question. Trey. 
there doesn't seem to be like an overarching organization in charge of um, roller derby today. Does that stem back to the collapse of the Seltzer Derby in 73? Or, and what's sort of keeping organizations now from getting in NFL of roller derby? Yeah. Or whatever? So this is also another conflict that they're debating. Do we want to become a professional sport? As now, they are not a professional sport, which is why there's the governing body of WIFTEDA, but really only a couple hundred leagues even belong to WIFTEDA out of the thousand. Um, th do we want to stay amateur or do we want to go pro? And that's also the other discussion that they're having. When the Seltzers owned it, it was a for-profit business. Um, obviously, the, the skaters got paid as professional athletes, but the Seltzers were making money off of it. So in the resurgence that comes out of Austin, Keep Austin Weird, you know, that was sort of the one thing they wanted is they didn't want to play into the commercialization of it in that same way. It was, for, again, for the skaters, by the skaters. So it might have a more equal structure if they went to professional in that way, but that's not something everybody wants to do. At the same time, though, even though the whole entire sport is amateur, there's vast discrepancy between leagues. Um, like the Lincoln team is one of the nationally ranked teams, but then there's other local teams around Nebraska that are just getting their start. Cannot, you could not go and just try out for the Lincoln team and make it. You would have to have skated somewhere else first. And um, a lot of the teams like New York City, Austin, um, Lincoln, but also some of the ones on the um, West Coast, are operating more on a professional model just because they're that good, um, but they're not getting paid for it. That's a good question. Any other questions? All right, I'll assume I covered it all. So, thank you.